Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining today's broadcast. Uh, your host is Jessica Fox. Jessica, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Max. Welcome everybody to our third day of the Pollinator Power Party. Today is Wednesday, and um, today is gonna be all about gardening uh, to support pollinators and butterflies and bees. Um, and um, and if you, you didn't catch up on the activities previously on Monday and Tuesday, check out our website. We have a phenomenal feed going. Um, the goal is to reach 1 million people in only five days to communicate about the importance of pollinators and what folks can be doing to, uh, to support them and how pollinators are, are intrinsically um, important for our own healthy lives. So check out the website. People have submitted hundreds of art pieces. We have um, a new song that's out. Yesterday was, uh, was uh, being wild cooked and we got a lot of recipes. There's even some uh, YouTube videos out there that got posted to our site with some cooking lessons and things like that. So I encourage folks to look at that. And then for tomorrow, um, we have the worldwide premiere of our documentary, Power for Pollinators. So it will happen uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time, 12 noon Pacific time. So be sure to, uh, to check that out. Um, if you haven't registered for the overall party, you're welcome to still do that. Um, and registration, make sure that you just get these daily emails that we're sending out with facts and, um, and little tidbits about pollinators, obscure pollinators, and things that we all sort of want to keep in mind. Um, so you can register today and get the links and everything for that. If you don't register, I know a lot of folks are watching today via our live YouTube um, broadcast. And that's awesome also, welcome. Um, uh, and you can always look at us via our YouTube broadcast. The folks that are on the WebEx have sort of a unique opportunity here to be submitting questions. And you could submit that through our chat box um, today throughout the lecture that we're gonna be hearing. Um, and if you're on the, just on YouTube, you can also send in questions to our email box and we have folks that are moderating that um, actively, and we will try to get to as many of those questions today as we, uh, on this live webcast. Um, the email is pollinators at epri.com, that's pollinators at epri.com, and you can send that in. Um, so, without further ado, I want to introduce our guest speaker. Our guest speaker is Scott Hoffman Black. He's, um, he's an internationally acclaimed conservation biologist. Um, he is the executive director of the Xerces Society. Xerces Society is one of the preeminent groups that um, does research and advances um, application of conservation work that supports invertebrates. And of course, um, pollinators are invertebrates. Um, and so we're really lucky to have Scott on. He's also the author of several best-selling books. One of them He's going to be talking through today, Gardening for Butterflies. Um, and I just as a personal note on, on my side, um, I, I know Scott, he's a friend of mine, and, um, and he's really been important for um, not only the work that we're doing at the Electric Power Research Institute related to pollinators, but, um, but in general. He works with farmers, with big, big companies, He's the guy that can be down home helping you identify the, um, the butterfly that's on, on your flower in your front yard. He's also the guy that can go to the CEO boardroom and talk about what the business case is for pollinators and how to allocate funding for them. So he's a soup to nuts kind of guy. We're really lucky to have him here. Um, so Scott, I'm gonna give you the ball here and let's get into your, to your lecture about gardening for butterflies. Okay, you should have the ball. I'm gonna take you off mute there, Scott. There you go. Hold on one sec. Scott, your line is now open. Scott, check your uh, cell phone quick and make sure you're not double muted there. Hold 
Hold on one second. Scott, you, um, we're not get picking up your audio. Is your phone on mute? I am unmuted. There uh, you go. Oh, okay. You're good to go. <laughs> we got you. Your, your computer had you uh, locked out there. You're yeah. all set. All right. Thanks, Jessica. And sorry for that little technical glitch there. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Jessica. And uh, I, as we were just getting ready to start, I just saw a swallowtail fly by outside my window. I'm, of course, working at home. And um, I was thinking that was a good sign until nobody could hear me speak. But uh, now you can, so that's good. And hopefully it is still a good sign. I, um, I'm so fortunate to, to get to talk to so many people about the issues that I find are really important. And um, I can't do this without a lot of help. So I like to do my thank yous right up front and get those out of the way and make sure they're done properly. And first and foremost, I want to thank EPRI. I want to thank Jessica. I want to thank her team. Whether it's working on pollinator conservation or whether it's providing technical assistance for somebody like me who I wouldn't say I'm a Luddite, but I certainly am not a technologically adept person. Um, they've been incredible partners for us. Uh, so thank you to EPRI for all they're doing uh, to conserve the world for pollinators. Um, I also want to thank my wife and kids. You know, they both empower and inspire me to do this job. Without them, I just don't know where I would be. So uh, they're, they're great to have around. And, and I have to say the one thing over the last few months is I've actually got more time to spend at home with them, which has been uh, a bit of a blessing amongst all of the issues going on. Um, I want to thank our partners and our members. We have 14,000 members, 100 scientists that we work with, or over dozens of agencies, many hundreds of farmers, over 50 companies, dozens of private foundations, and tens of thousands of community scientists and everyday people taking action. And, and really, at the end of the day, it's about us all partnering together to make the world a better place. And um, we Xerces couldn't do it with without everybody out there um, helping us. I will just point out that we are a donor supported nonprofit. So if you like what you hear, um, want to know more, go to our website, think about think about donating. This is how we're able to to do our work. And then last but not least, I, I need to thank our incredibly dedicated and professional staff across the United States. You know, we've now got 55 people working across North America to make the world a better place for everything from, from pollinators to freshwater mussels. Um, Last, I need to just thank my co-authors. I'm going to be talking about the Gardening for Butterflies book. It was a big lift to do this, um, and I want to thank the co-authors because they did a great job, as well as Brian Reynolds, whose incredible photos graced this, this book. Very last, some of you may have never heard of the Xerce Society, and, and that's how it's pronounced, the Xerce Society. I've heard it pronounced the Exercy Society, but that's uh, not how I tend to uh, pronounce it. We're named after the first butterfly to go extinct due to humans in the United States, the Xerces blue butterfly. And Robert Michael Pyle, who founded Xerces, felt that there should be an organization dedicated to the smaller animals, the sometimes forgotten animals. Um, Xerces has grown a lot since then, but we're still focused on the little things that run the world. So I'm really excited today to talk to you about butterflies. Um, I know a lot of people talk about pollinators and, and, and there's a lot of focus on bees, um, but I started as a butterfly guy. I now work on a broad, broad variety of taxa from bees to freshwater mussels to tiger beetles to butterflies. But, but really, I started my life loving um, butterflies and really excited to talk to you today about why should you care and then what can you do for these lovely animals? Well, first, why should you care? Um, you know, butterflies, you might see them flitting around out there, but what are they actually doing and, and why are they important? 
Well, first to understand that, you have to think about diversity. Um, there's an amazing diversity of butterflies and, and moths worldwide, over 160,000 species. They're found in every continent except Antarctica, and they fill niches from deserts to mountaintops, providing ecological services. Now, again, when most people think of pollinators, they think of bees, but butterflies are also quite important for pollination. They're not important for our crops. Um, there are really no butterflies or moths that pollinate crop species or, or few. Um, and, uh, but they are really important for pollination in wild areas. And they're likely really important for what we long distance transfer of pollen, which uh, allows for what's called outcrossing. Um, it allows for genetic diversity of plants in the landscape. Bees focus locally because they have a nest locally. Butterflies often are traveling from one place to the other and are able to move that pollen. But it's not just pollination. Butterflies and moths are food for numerous animals. Um, grizzly bears actually eat a large number, certain grizzly bear populations eat a large number of moth caterpillars as part of their diet. And caterpillars are also a vital food for many types of birds. Many birds would not be able to live out their life cycle without moth and butterfly caterpillars. But it's not just the ecology. Beyond, the e beyond ecology and the ecosystem, uh, butterflies generate millions and millions and millions of dollars, both nationally and for local communities where butterfly watchers uh, go to, to see butterflies in parks, in natural areas. We also have a lot of places like the Butterfly Pavilion in Westminster, Colorado, who partners with Xerces. And uh, they generate a lot of local revenue for, uh, for the local community. But unfortunately, even though they're important, even though they're beautiful, um, butterflies are in trouble. Um, uh, I'm not going to go deep into the data, but wherever you look, butterflies seem to be declining. Um, the UK, uh, uh, England, and, um, and the United Kingdom have the longest term data sets for butterflies. They've been monitoring butterflies for probably 100 years. And unfortunately, those long term data sets are showing really massive decline, 52% uh, decline in abundance at monitored sites and over 47% of the butterfly geographic ranges declining. But it's not just the UK. We've now been able to start to look in the United States through a variety of studies. And, and I think everybody thinks about the monarch butterfly. Of course, the monarch butterfly is in trouble. Um, the Eastern monarch has declined by 80% and the Western monarch has declined by over 99%. Um, but other butterflies are, are not faring any, any better. An Ohio study found that a 33% reduction in butterfly abundance over 21 years. And a long-term study in California is finding declines in all butterfly taxa across all of their site. So um, uh, this is a serious issue and uh, is something we definitely need to address. And of course, it's not just butterflies. We're seeing uh, biodiversity decline um, and insects are such an important part of that biodiversity and a study that I worked on uh, with researchers showed that basically wherever we look but uh, insects are declining uh, uh, across the board. Um, what's causing it? Well, it is a real combination of issues. Of course, habitat loss, these animals need habitat to survive. We've got pesticides, which are a, a major issue for insects. Of course, insecticides kill insects. We've got invasive species. We've got climate change that's overlying all of this. And we've got a lot of smaller things like lights, for instance, um, turning off your lights at night can really help moths. We've also got land use. And land use and management, interestingly, can be both positive or negative depending on how, uh, how you focus on it. So 
The good thing, though, about butterflies and other pollinators is we can do something about it. These insects are small, they're resilient, and if we take action now, we can really make a difference. And that's what I'm going to talk about now, uh, is it's how we make the world a better place for butterflies, and in doing so, make the world really a better place for for all pollinators, for birds, and for, for everything else. So interestingly though, the first step in being able to plan a butterfly garden is really to start to get to know what butterflies might frequent your garden. Um, uh, you know, you can put in a pollinator garden, put in a lot of plants and, and a lot of bees and some butterflies might come. But if you wanna maximize your garden to attract butterflies, you need to think about specific host plants. And I'll talk uh, quite a bit more about host plants in, in just a minute. But to find out what butterflies you might have in your region, in your area, and might visit your yard, the first step is to find an identification guide and to look up what butterflies uh, uh, you might be able to attract. And now I prefer these regional guides, but there are many national guides as well. So. First step, go out, find a guide, and start looking at the beautiful butterflies and, and find out which ones are in your area. And I, I, I tend to refer in this talk to butterflies, but uh, the neat thing is that the thing, most of what we do for butterflies will also attract moths to your yard. What's the difference, though, between a moth and a butterfly? Because I think understanding a little bit about the differences in these animals and the differences in the butterflies you you see can help you to decide uh, what to do in your garden. But just briefly, the, the the animal on the left side of your screen near the bottom is a butterfly and the animal on the top uh, in the middle of the screen is a moth. And there are some basic differences. Moths tend to hold their wings flat over their back, whereas um, butterflies hold their wings upright. But one of the main uh, ways you can tell them is by the antenna. If you look at that butterfly, you can see a knob at the end of that antenna. You can actually see a little bit of orange on that knob. Not all of them have color on the knob, but all butterflies have an antenna with a knob at the end whereas moths either have a pileate antenna, that's that frilly antenna that the males have. They use that antenna to, to, um, to smell where females might be, or uh, a single filament uh, that tapers to a point, which is what the females have. Beyond moths, there are five major families of butterflies with around 800 species in the US and Canada. And they fall into, as I said, these five, five major groups, which we call families. Um, we've got, in a, starting at the left, the skippers. These are small, kind of nondescript, usually brown butterflies that you might see flitting through a meadow or your garden. We've got the swallowtails. That's what I saw outside my window before we started, was a, a, a big Western tiger swallowtail. They're one of our largest and most showy butterflies uh, that you'll find throughout North America. We've got our whites and sulfurs, which is just as, as uh, it sounds. Some of them are white, some of them are yellow. Actually, a, 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 another subset is called the marbles, which uh, are marbled white color uh, in there. We've got the gossamer wings, uh, which include what are called the blues, uh, the blue butterflies and their relatives are often small, but often very, very brightly colored. And then we have the brushfoot butterflies, which include the monarch, include painted ladies, include some of the more showy and larger butterflies that you might see out there. So get a book, find out what you might have, and start to learn a little bit about the butterflies. It's going to help you in, in your gardening. The next thing you need to know is the butterfly life cycle. Um, butterflies begin life as an egg um, and they lay their eggs on a host plant. As I said, I'm gonna talk a bit more uh, about host plants. They hatch into tiny soft-bodied caterpillars. 
they go through what are called instars. It's each stage as they grow is called an instar. And they, they burst their skin uh, and grow larger with each of those transformations. And they usually, but not always, they usually have five of those. Then they pupate or have a chrysalis. And the chrysalis or pupa is the mummy-like stage between the larva and the adult. This is where um, uh, insects totally change what they look like is, is in this pupa or in, in butterflies called the chrysalis stage. And then they emerge as this incredible, um, incredible animal that can fly. And I know I'm geeky, I know I'm sciencey geeky, but I find the life cycle of these insects just to be truly remarkable. And if you have your garden, you will be able to see a garden for butterflies, see all of it in one place. So based on that, we know a little bit about butterflies and you know their life history, what do they need? Well, first, if you want butterflies in your garden, you need to think about food plants for their caterpillars. And that's what I, when I'm referring to a host plant or a larval host plant, um, that's the food plant. Um, all butterflies in North America, except for one in Hawaii, need um, need host plants. They need to lay their eggs on some specific plant that their larva can eat. They also need nectar to fuel their activities. They need safe places to take shelter and they need protection from insecticides. And the cool thing, as I mentioned about one of the neat things why I love working on insects is that you can make a difference even if you have a small yard, uh, even if um, even if you have a few pots on your deck to just attract some bees and butterflies, you can make a difference if you do it the right way. And that is what I think is so cool. If you plant it, they will come. And, um, and if you do it right, you can have incredible diversity in your yard. So as I mentioned, the first uh, thing to think about is host plants. You need to match host plants to the species you want to attract. Um, and so, for instance, monarchs, I think we all think of monarchs, they need appropriate native milkweed. Um, Sechem skipper, St. Augustine grass, the silvery blue, um, you know, pea plants in the pea family, common buckeye, uh, plants in the snapdragon or plantain family. So you need to know what butterflies you might be attracting and then think about what plants might work in your yard. It's important to focus on natives because native butterflies have co-evolved with native plants. Um, research by Doug Calamy showed that native plants support four times as many native butterfly and moss species as, as introduced plants. They often also grow better uh, in, in situations in gardens and have fewer pest problems. So, so focus, especially for host plants, on natives. And expand your idea of what a host plant is. You know, most people think of host plants, they think of wildflowers or grasses, but many trees are also host plants. Choke cherry, willows, um, at least 23 butterfly and moss species use oaks alone. Um, so look around, you may already have some host plants uh, that you don't know about. That's the other thing to think about with host plants, especially if you have certain tree species in or near your garden. And then also take a step back and think about moths. I mean, as I mentioned, just creating a butterfly or pollinator garden, you're likely to be helping moths. But then you could pick some pale flowers uh, such as uh, Datura or a uh, common evening primrose. And, and there are guides to, to local moth species. And, and this is the Io moth, which is just startlingly beautiful. They can be just as beautiful as, as the butterflies and they are just as important. Um, the last thing about host plants is don't focus on rare and at-risk species, I would say, unless you've been doing this for a while. I often get approached about, can I attract this species to my yard? Because I know it's rare, I know it's in trouble. The monarch, yes, you can do that. But most rare butterflies have very specific habitat requirements that really are not going to be uh, found in your garden. So better to focus on more common butterflies and butterfly diversity.
Next, think about nectar sources. Of course, just like bees, butterflies need flowers to fuel their flight. Bees, of course, use both pollen and nectar, but butterflies just use nectar. And there are many great plants. This is Joe Pie Weed, which actually is an incredible nectar source, but also a host plant. And so you can look for plants that are both host plants and nectar plants. Um, then focus on diversity. Think about a diversity of bloom from late winter to late fall. Um, and this is not different than what you would want to do for butterflies. Um, so putting in a butter, or sorry, for, for other pollinators like bees, putting in a butterfly garden basically is a pollinator garden with extras, um, you know, just thinking about, uh, about butterflies, but provide that diversity um, all the way through from, uh, from, as I said, late winter to late fall, wherever you live. You will attract a lot more animals that way if you have a fairly consistent bloom throughout the season. Now, I mentioned natives. Non-natives can be okay. Uh, some of these non-natives, especially as nectar plants, do provide very good and ample nectar. We live, our gardens are man-made structures. So um, I've used in my garden some of these non-natives to fill in both the color gaps as well as gaps in timing of bloom so that I do have that, uh, that year-long bloom. And you can make a dynamic garden that's mostly native, but with some of these great non-natives as well. But avoid cultivated plant varieties. Um, a lot of uh, cultivated varieties like double-petaled or other uh, varieties actually don't no longer produce nectar. So if you're using non-natives, make sure you're using those older varieties and not something that is all there for show and not for function. So most people think about nectar and that makes sense and host plants, okay, now that makes sense. But one important thing that's left out of many gardens is shelter. Just like you and me, we can go get our dinner, but it's nice to be able to go home and have our shelter after dinner. The same is true with butterflies. Um, doesn't matter what stage they're in, they need places to shelter from storms, they may need places to shelter to overwinter. They need places uh, to shelter their pupa. Um, they, they need a, a diversity in the landscape and places to go that aren't fully manicured. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned pupa. All butterflies must pupate. Um, and uh, caterpillars often pupate on or near their host plants. Um, but sometimes they'll crawl a long way away and sometimes they'll crawl to really hidden areas under duff or leaf litter, in a tree crevice, tall grasses. Sometimes you're lucky enough, like Penny Snow here who took this picture, to have your butterflies crawl up onto your fence and pupate uh, on your fence. So sometimes you will see them right out in the open but often they're out of sight and out of mind, and you need to realize that in your gardening. So one thing I like to say about gardens is have a little chaos. Um, either you don't have to have chaos throughout your garden, but the corners of your garden, add a little chaos. Let areas overgrow a little bit. Have brush piles, have uh, big bunch grasses. You know, these are also great places for uh, for bumblebee nests as well. So sometimes I think we get so manicured in our gardening and manicured in our gardening really doesn't invite animals to really enjoy our garden to the fullest extent. Brush piles can be really important. Um, I tend to br have brush piles in the corners of my yards and a lot of animals will live in and under brush piles. It's not just butterflies, but bumblebees I've had nest in. And I have also um, have spotted towhees nest in my brush pile. So it's really, really um, great. And again, you don't need to, um, uh-oh, my cursor's frozen. So I don't know, uh, there we go. Um, you don't need to um, 
uh, to have that brush pile in the middle of your yard. You know, you can certainly do it at the edges, but allow a little messy messiness. Um, I do want to take a moment to, to talk about pesticides. In certain places, pesticides can be useful tools, but pesticides, especially insecticides, are designed to kill insects, and butterflies are insects. So you need to be incredibly cautious uh, about using uh, pesticides for uh, in and around your pollinator or, or, or butterfly garden. And I have found that in yard settings, you really don't need pesticides. Um, you can do so much by just through cultural practices and, and other ways. Um, so avoid using them, but if you must use them, um, minimize their use and, and think about how you use them. And, and be warned that label instructions often do not protect native bees or butterflies. The label instructions are all often designed with honeybees in mind, which is good. We want to protect honeybees, but using them even under label uh, instructions can hurt the, the animals in your, in your yard. Also, make sure that you ask your nursery manager whether pesticides have been used on the plants that you're buying from the nursery. A recent study by the Xerces Society and the University of Nevada, Reno, found high levels of several pesticides in milkweeds found at nurseries. So terrible that you could be buying a plant that you're hoping is helping these animals and it could actually poison them. And when you think about pests in your garden, again, you really don't need these products. You know, focus on healthy plants and healthy soils. Natives help. Um, but pick and remove pests if you have them. Um, that's what I've done all my life as I go out. I'm in my garden a lot. I see a pest, I pick off and remove it or I use, use, uh, um, use uh, a, a spray of water. This is just very quick, but be careful about, or careful maybe is the wrong word. Um, butterfly houses just don't work. Um, they don't attract butterflies. These are sold. Sometimes they can be pretty expensive. Oh, butterflies will overwinter here. I've never had a colleague of, uh, or anybody be able to document that butterflies use these. Um, spiders will use them. Other beneficial insects might use them, but um, I don't want you to go out and pay a bunch of money and uh, think that butterflies will actually use these, these butterfly houses. So just a few ideas to wrap up about garden design. Um, and, you know, butterfly gardens can be designed for almost any space. You know, small spaces, wet areas like rain gardens are, are great for butterflies, but so are xeriscape gardens. You, you know, you can attract a lot of butterflies uh, in, in a xeriscape landscape. And, you know, the southwestern U.S. with our driest landscapes actually has some of the highest diversity uh, of butterflies. And a garden like this, which is one of our, our partners at CRCs with a water feature and host plants and nectar plants can really attract a, a great diversity of, of not just butterflies, but bees and other insects and wildlife. Um, and, you know, you think of your your backyard as a multi-use area. If chosen properly, um, uh, uh, butterfly host plants, uh, uh, nectar sources, as well as shelter can all be in one fairly small space. Move the brush piles to the edge, um, you know, uh, but keep some of that messiness. And you, you can do this in, in a really quite a small space. And, and also think about the plants you might already have as this, this uh, you know, we've got um, oaks in this yard, which as I mentioned, are, are a great host plant for, for several butterflies and moths. This works for larger spaces as well. Um, you can design uh, butterfly gardens uh, for almost any multi-use space. One thing to think about there are paths. People want to, if you really want people to experience your uh, landscape, having paths that go through can allow people to see what's there without trampling uh, your, your landscape. And, and, and be okay with a little trampling if kids run through your landscape as well, because 
letting kids experience a little nature is worth a broken stem or two on, on our plants. Um, we can do this though in, in larger landscapes and some of you may work at facilities or uh, work on power line rights of way and wonder whether you can incorporate butterfly conservation into existing, uh, into existing efforts uh, at, at pollinator conservation or other wildlife conservation. And you certainly can. Um, one thing I do want to point out in, in summing is that I've seen a lot of large conservation pollinate, pollinator projects, large projects for pollinator conservation that unfortunately don't think about butterflies. They leave out host plants. They focus on nectar for bees and maybe for butterflies, but they leave out, out host plants. But you don't have to. Um, you can successfully integrate these plantings into large scale or the butterflies into large scale plantings. It can be done really easily and oftentimes it can be done in a way that helps all pollinators, helps birds, maybe helps rare bees, um, uh, but you just have to take a step back and think about what you're planting. Um, so Xerces really has tried to incorporate into all our materials um, uh, uh, plants that would be beneficial, not just for bees, but for butterflies and for moths as well. So the next time you're thinking of a project, you know, think about the butterflies and think about how you can have an additive effect beyond just maybe the bees that are out on the landscape. And even farmers are doing this. You know, Xerces has our Bee Better Certified um, seal, uh, and it's focused on bees, but you know, farmers get points towards certification for adding host plants for butterflies. Butterflies don't pollinate their crops, but they're important for ecosystem service. And we've had lots of farmers who are just really excited to be able to support the bees as well as the butterflies. And with that, take the next step, get a guide, um, start thinking about what butterflies you might already have or be able to attract um, find a good butterfly gardening book. Um, I, you know, of course, I wrote this, so I may be biased, but um, I think that our butterfly gardening book, it lays out a, a, a lot of the, the ideas as well as has a, a really robust host plant list in the back uh, of it. Um, and take that next step. Um, plant a plant. Um, also, it, just in, in last, don't overthink it. Um, I know some people are like, well, I need to design this before I can start. Get a book, find out two butterflies or one butterfly and add that host plant to your existing plant palette. See if you get it. Add some, uh, a little bit later, add some nectar sources, add another host plant, build your garden over time. Um, that's the way I've done mine. And uh, I now luckily have many, many animals that, that come and uh, that my kids and I can watch every day. So with that, uh, thanks for taking the time to listen. And I hope you will go out and do some butterfly gardening. Great, Scott, that was incredible. That, that lecture was just filled with all kinds of, uh, of information and details. I want to get into it a little bit. On the Gardening for Butterflies book, if you registered for the Pollinator Power Party, 10 people will be, um, will win through a lottery, random lottery, to receive a free copy of the book that will have a personalized um, dedication from Scott in the cover and signed by him and will be shipped to you. Um, so that is an exciting um, added uh, one of our party favors here coming out. So um, we're going to go to a Q&A. We have about 20 minutes to do a Q&A. So if you have questions, there's a number of questions that are getting submitted through our chat um, here. If um, Stephanie, if you could give me the ball back, I'll go back to the slide to show folks how to, how to submit questions through the chat. You can also send us questions um, in our uh, pollinators at EPRI.com. And we have a couple moderators that I'm going to go to in a minute. 
But Scott, I'm going to take the opportunity. I have a, I have a couple of questions for you. You've taught me a lot about butterflies and, and how to, uh, how to support them really on larger landscapes. Um, that's been a lot of our work together is looking at these big, large landscapes. Um, so a question though, that I think, um, might have been something to think about that I, that I want to talk about for a minute is I want to run at my back in my backyard. I want to have a butterfly party in two months from now. I want to have the biggest butterfly party with my friends. So let's just say my backyard doesn't have anything in it now. It's like, a, it's just blank, right? But in two months, I'm going to have all my friends over. You're invited, Mr. Black. We're going to have a big butterfly party. So I got these packets of seed, right? They're butterfly seed mix. And I, I'm going to go put them in tomorrow because you inspired me. So what's my party going to look like in two months? When everybody's there and these, I just want butterflies everywhere. I want, I want my friends to have butterflies swirling. So yeah. what, what are my chances? Well, I hate to say what you should do is uh, take them to a park with an established butterfly garden. Um, the one thing I always say, whether you're working in your yard or whether you're working on a landscape, you need a little patience. Plants take time to grow. And especially from seed, you know, you will not go from seed to flower in most plants in two months. Um, what I would do in your yard to get started would be to get some maybe showy annuals, like plant some, uh, might not be too late to get some sunflower and some other plants uh, that would uh, potentially attract some butterflies. But I would think about your garden for next year. If you're starting now, think about what plants you might put in and uh, where you would put them and what, what host plants you might have. And, and if you do have the money, um, and I know this costs more, in a yard setting, the nice thing is you can often buy uh, plants that are already established in pots. And so you could, uh, Jessica, if you wanted to think about and drop some dollar, buy some very established plants and put them in, and you might have uh, some of these butterflies uh, flitting around. But, but one of the things I really do say is, is patience. Gardening, I think anybody who gardens, um, uh, patience is a virtue, and you learn patience in, in your garden. Um, things that come very quickly uh, and easily often may not last. Um, so take a step back, take a great breath of fresh air and start working in your garden. And um, next June or July, have your great party with all your friends. And I'm sorry my great. answer is not better for you that you're going to have this party, but um, but but patience, it takes patience to, to garden. Yeah, right. Okay, excellent. Yeah, what we, what we tell people in working with companies, they, they do that too. They want to have their CEO out. They call us, they say, we're going to do a party next month with our CEO. Get us going on some pollinator habitat. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, might take two, three, four years, like before you really see that thing pop up, right? And it is worth, it is worth the wait. It's worth the wait. Usually in my experience, it's year four or five that you just see those things going crazy. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I will, Jessica, say that in your garden, you can do this more quickly. You know, you have more flexibility. Mm. You could bring in some potted plants. You also likely are able to water more. You can get establishment faster, even from seed. Um, you could start some of your seed as I've done uh, earlier in the season in little greenhouses. There are just a lot more options in a small space to have it be quicker, but you're right, not two months, but at least 12 and maybe 24 to get a really good established in your yard. And then in a wild landscape, yes, it can be two, three, four years, five years, for that incredible bloom when you've got that incredible diversity of animals visiting it. Great. Okay, let's go to questions from um, the attendees. And Ms. Fiona Baker is on the phone and will help moderate our Q&A session. 
Fiona? Absolutely. Thanks, Jessica. Scott, you talked a lot about, you know, keeping some chaos in your yard, and I think that this question aligns closely with that. Someone asked, should we cut down the butterfly plants in the fall before the winter or let them live a natural cycle? Um, with my butterfly garden, it is plant dependent. Um, there are some plants that uh, it is helpful to cut back. But in my butterfly garden, I don't clean up until the next year. Um, a little bit to the consternation of my wife, who uh, in late fall, um, my garden gets kind of messy. But, you know, a lot of our plants go to seed. Uh, birds often use the seeds from, from these plants. Um, insects can be, you know, almost anywhere in the landscape. So I tend to do that cleanup. Um, the next spring, and I do it in stages. Um, you know, once the seeds have fallen off the stalks, you can certainly cut those stalks. Just be thoughtful and um, don't maybe do it all at once. So um, again, the fall is a time when lots of animals are sheltering for the winter and when lots of birds are actually um, uh, filling up on seed. And a lot of our plants uh, that are good for bees and butterflies are great uh, seed source for birds. So let that play out and at least wait till winter and just start to think about taking a lighter approach. Um, as I said, that he manicured yard, um, manicured garden sometimes can look really pretty, but often doesn't have the spaces to really maximize the diversity of butterflies or bees. Thanks, Scott. We've got another one that asks about ideas for water sources if you don't have a stream or natural running water in your yard. And I want to add to that, um, hummingbird feeders exist. Are there other similar non-plant options that someone could install to help um, butterflies in their garden? Yeah, so, um, you know, butterflies will visit bird baths. So especially, depending on where you are, water, is a vital resource for all sorts of animals, from bees to butterflies to birds. And having a, um, a bird bath or what I call a bird bath uh, that you clean out regularly, that will get visited by bees, butterflies, as, as well as the birds. So yeah, think about a, a water source, um, unless you're in a you know, very wet area and there, or there are other water sources close by. Ponds can be helpful. And even having, and I, water conservation is important, so be a little careful with this, but even having a little drip into mud, um, butterflies will, what they call puddle, they will actually be attracted to a mud puddle. Um, and I've sometimes seen four, six, eight species all attracted to the same mud puddle, which is really neat. Uh, another way, similar to a hummingbird feeder, that you can um, uh, view butterflies. It's not really, it might help them a little, um, but it's a great way to congregate them, is to put out a bit of rotten fruit on a tray. And um, if you have butterflies around as well as bees around, they will really visit that rotten fruit. Uh, one caveat, so will yellow jackets. And so you want to be a little bit careful um, if you start to get yellow jackets visiting. And this is something that's very ephemeral. You don't want to leave it there until it gets really manky and, you know, moldy. You know, you put semi-rotten fruit out for a day or two, and then you clean it, and then you can do it again. But it is a neat way. I know people that have one right out their window, and they'll just put it out there sometimes, and they'll kind of, Jessica, do it at a party once they've got the... Um, uh, butterfly garden, and they may have two or three species that people can really easily see. Um, uh, great for, especially for people who might be mobility impaired that can't get out into the garden, you can bring uh, butterflies closer to them. Excellent. I think that's also a great summer tip as we all buy produce and then uh, maybe turn a blind eye for a little too long and then suddenly something's a little overripe. That's right. Um, we've had a, a number of questions come in about specific regions and, and, you know, what should I plant in my garden? So I wanted to echo back, you've mentioned the guides a couple times. Can you talk more about what types of information you'll find in those guides? Yes, yeah, so I, I think you need two things here to have a successful butterfly garden. And it's one of the reasons um, that in this short of a, you know, 
uh, a talk, I don't go into a lot of specific host plants because um, it really, again, is dependent on what butterflies you have in your area and what butterflies you might be able to attract to your garden. So to me, getting that guide, whatever guide, look up online. As I said, there's some great national ones, but they're often great local guides. I like to support the local uh, folks when I can. Look up, go through and look up what butterflies are found in your area. And usually the good guides will talk about what habitat needs they have, what their host plants are. Um, and whether they are found in gardens. Good guides tell you, you know, well, you're only going to find this out along stream sides or you're going to only find this out way in the desert or on a mountaintop. Um, they will almost always say found in gardens, meadows, and focus on the ones in gardens, look at what the host plants are, and go to your native plant nursery and start talking to them about what host plants they might have available. And really, that's the way to do it because I can give you really broad generalizations, uh, but even at a national level, I think we have a hundred different potential host plants in our book. That is a great place to start. We do have host plants that work for a variety. We tried to point out host plants that work for, you know, really weren't the specialist ones that work for a variety of butterflies. But again, it really depends on where you are, what butterflies you have, and um, a little bit on your garden space, right? And, and what might fit in with that garden space. And the one thing that I usually always talk about, and it, it escaped me, is remember that you're planting plants that you hope will be eaten. I actually had a lady who started a butterfly garden and then emailed me totally distressed because all of her beautiful plants were being eaten by caterpillars that she invited into her yard with her host plants. <laughs> so the goal is to have your plants eaten, maybe not to the ground, right? Um, but it, the goal is to invite plant the, the, the butterflies in so they lay eggs and have them eat your, at least part of your host plants. So, you know, that changes the dynamic in your garden. You're not going to have this perfect plant. Your goal is to have a, um, a non-perfect plant with caterpillars on it. Hey, Scott, this is Jessica. So, um, so okay, I have to pause. Fiona has a whole bunch of questions in the queue from the audience. So I'm going to jump in just quick. So you talk about host plants, you talked about pollen, and you talked about nectar and flowers. So the you said the butterflies don't uh, really eat pollen like bees do, right? Pollen is a really important source of protein for bees. Butterflies don't eat pollen, uh, but they do have nectar. So what is this? So butterflies going around, they're eating their nectar. What's the host plant deal? How is that different from your nectar and your pollen and this host plant? Well, Why is it saying host plant? Yeah, interestingly, um, you're exactly right. Bees use pollen and nectar they provision their nest with pollen and nectar for their young to sometimes in a, the native bees in a, what's called a bee, bee bread or a bee ball. And, and they, uh, they eat that and it's complex carbohydrates and proteins and things. Um, adult butterflies have what's called a proboscis. It's a straw that they stick in and suck up liquids. So they can't, eat pollen, although there are some butterflies in Central and South America, and I think even up, there's one species even maybe up into the very Southeast that at times does eat pollen, but they really are the exception. Um, so the host plant is really vital because actually some butterflies and even more moths never eat. Um, uh, butterflies are simply eating so that they can produce eggs, or um, hopefully small children know what this is, uh, eggs or sperm, so that those, you know, they can uh, mate and fertilize the eggs and they can develop. But the host plant is for the caterpillar. And the most of the growth in a butterfly is, is in the caterpillar stage. Many of them come really fully formed 
to do whatever they're going to do. They can start mating some of the butterflies the minute they emerge from their chrysalis. Um, uh, but some of them do need to fuel flight, especially our, far, our ones that go farther, like monarchs use a lot of nectar, swallowtails, the ones that fly a lot. So the host plants for the caterpillars, it, you can't have a successful life cycle without host plants but a lot of butterflies also need flowers, need nectar um, to fuel that flight, to fuel their mating. Keeping on the theme of, of host plants, we had a question come in. Uh, you've talked about beneficial uses and multiple uses of, of different things. Are hummingbirds attracted to the same host and pollen plants as those for butterflies and, and bees and other pollinators as well? Oftentimes. So the overlap between butterflies and hummingbirds is great. And it, you can think about it this way. Um, you know, butterflies and moths have that long proboscis. They can go to a plant and stick their long mouth part into flute-shaped flowers. Um, the hummingbirds really like flute-shaped flowers. They have that long beak, they stick their head in, and they're also sipping nectar. So yes, um, and if you look at any of our resources, the majority of our resources also let say whether it's a hummingbird plant. So we have a, a, our book, 100 Plants to Feed the Bees. And with each of those 100 plants, we say whether those are important for butterflies and also whether they're important for, for hummingbirds. But yes, that's the neat thing about a butterfly garden or a pollinator garden or a hummingbird garden is that they are multi-use. Um, just tweaking it, right? You put in some pollinator plants and, oh, what might hummingbirds use? Oh, they like red flowers and they like red fluted flowers. Um, uh, let's, you know, put in some of those. Oh, and butterflies in my area like these host plants. We can put in some of those. And you will build a dynamic landscape that attracts an incredible diversity of wildlife. And once you attract that bottom layer, then you're also going to attract the birds um, that, that come in to use those resources as well. Um, and in my garden, you'll attract the dragonflies, which um, my neighbor was just asking me whether I was okay with it because the dragonflies will sometimes come in and eat some of your butterflies and eat some of your bees. <laughs> um, but to me, I'm building this dynamic system and my goal is to have that system. And if I've got a good enough habitat that dragonflies are actually eating some of those animals in there, I think I've done my part for my little piece of nature. Absolutely, it sounds like you've built a robust ecosystem. If you don't have predators and prey, then there's, there's not much to grow on. Um, one question that I think is really important, and, and you've talked about different installations and pollinator gardens that have been built in different places. What are the economic arguments that you would make as you talk to, you know, utility execs or just board of directors or community, um, especially if that town isn't necessarily a hotbed of butterfly tourism? Well, you know, it, it doesn't matter where you are, whether this is directly an economic benefit or uh, tangentially an economic benefit. Having nature, um, uh, robust nature helps us all. It helps with clean air. It helps mitigate climate change. Um, uh, it helps uh, wildlife and biodiversity. And so there are just so many benefits to this that I, I, one, I think those benefits are there. It doesn't matter where you are. And then number two, people love pollinators. People love butterflies. People love birds. They want to protect them. And if a power company is doing the right thing and able to talk to their constituents about how and why they're doing the right thing, boy, it seems like a direct benefit uh, to me and and can be a powerful um, argument uh, for making really positive changes uh, pretty much in any landscape. Okay, Scott, we're almost at the end. I'm going to take the last question here. Um, 
what is your favorite butterfly species? My favorite butterfly species, which I did not get a chance to talk to, is a butterfly uh, called um, uh, the Uncompagre fritillary, uh, Bolaria acronema. Um, this is a butterfly I studied in uh, when I was a graduate student, and it was one of the best times in my life. This butterfly only lives uh, under year-round snow above 13,000 feet in the San Juan Mountains of Colorado. So I got to spend all summer long traipsing around uh, looking for populations of, of this butterfly. This butterfly, unfortunately, is threatened because of climate change, as you can imagine, being at the tops of these mountains. Um, it's not what you think. It's not a big showy butterfly. It's actually a little drab by most people's uh, probably estimation. But for me, that's certainly my my favorite butterfly. Okay, excellent. All right, Scott, thank you very much. So we have a lot of questions that are kind of still in the hopper, but we're at the end of our hour. Um, so we will try to uh, email some some answers through to folks. And then just wanted to hit on the last, the last thing here before we close out today. This is our party social wall. Anything that you post to our hashtag, that's a hashtag power in pollinators, um, goes up on our social wall. This feed is gigantic. We have created like a whole new pollinator cookbook yesterday. The day before was like an art gallery. We did a pop-up art and, and kind of music um, a festival on Monday night. Um, and so keep things coming in. Send your selfies in. There's a little dog. <laughs> um, so send your selfies in um, and ideas and comments. This is just uh, incredible, the amount of energy that's coming in here on our feed um, this week. And I think we're, I think we have a pretty good crack at reaching a million people to talk about the importance of pollinators um, in only five days. What a goal, and I think we're gonna hit it. So, um, Scott, thank you so much for the lecture. Um, based on the, the response and number of questions and folks viewing here on the WebEx and YouTube, I can tell you this is a very popular lecture. Um, and, uh, and we'll be sending the books out for folks, too. Uh, 10 people will receive a surprise gift they will win the lottery and get uh, Scott's autograph there and his and his book. Um, so I think that closes us out for today, Scott. Any final comments that you want to say? Um, you, well, check out our website. Check out EPRI and uh, what they have on there uh, for their resources. There are a lot of resources out there to help you. And and as I say, just take a step. That's uh, once you take a step it might become a long, lifelong journey of putting in plants for pollinators, including butterflies. So, so just do the little thing now and, and then see what happens. Great, excellent. And remember, join us back tomorrow, um, Thursday at um, 12 uh, Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. We will have our worldwide premiere of Power for pollinators that will come out. You, you won't want to miss that. It's a 20 minute documentary film, all original footage of bees and butterflies and beetles. Um, and then there'll be a short um, director's perspective section for about 10 minutes to share kind of behind the scenes what it was like to do that film uh, over the last couple of years. So join us tomorrow for that. It's narrated by Carrie Ann Moss, who's um, the lead and uh, one of the, the co-lead in the Matrix trilogy. Um, uh, her name was Trinity in there. She is the, I guess she's the girlfriend of uh, Keanu Reeves. I don't want to misspeak um, in the Matrix. So join us <laughs> for tomorrow. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Scott. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we'll send any remaining questions over to you so you can help us answer those. Excellent. Okay, Happy that birthday. closes us up. Thank you. Okay, great. Everybody have a great day, and we will see you back tomorrow at 12 noon Pacific time. Okay, bye.